said, these are just a few pictures. And basically, we in Oahu, there's been only a couple of beekeepers that have seen it. You guys definitely have, are very familiar with it and certainly know that it can be very, very abundant. And um, I would like and I, uh, you know, make sure to ask questions to Dr. Douglasman in terms of the relative, you know, abundance, I guess, of these things. But we were shocked, you know, as we worked through highs here to see the numbers of both adults and larvae that can accumulate in these hives. And, you know, you are well aware of that. Um, they do have a tremendously high reproductive rate. Um, we, these pictures were taken yesterday and uh, Bo can attest to that. Uh, I mean, I guess two days ago. And there's a patch of eggs, a little batch of eggs right there, you know, um, sitting on top of the, the frame. And they, you know, they are laid in clusters. And we were amazed of all the little nooks and crevices they can find to lay eggs. Um, also, we were amazed about basically how fast, you know, something can go from just a few beetles to, you know, a full-blown infestation. And um, we also, and this is from before, um, when it first got here um, last year, and the numbers can increase tremendous, tremendous, uh, very, very quickly. So, you know, especially if you have lots of hives, like some of the commercial uh, honey producers, you can end up with very, very scary kind of uh, situations. Um, we also have been seeing and talking to people, and people have been very open, and, you know, I encourage you guys to be open to us and open to Danielle, you know, in terms of what you're doing and, and why you're trying to do this, is people are trying different strategies um, from different types of traps to different numbers of traps per colony, to different baits in the traps, and with, you know, different success and different uh, uh, alternatives, I guess, and ways of disposing of the material, where, you know, how often do you check them. All these things are going to be extremely, extremely important that you communicate to us, to Danielle, to the people who can potentially sort of summarize the individual experiences. And you actually also plans to continue you know, some work on basically trying to figure out the efficacy of some of the traps that you guys are using. And again, this is why you know, I'll be asking for cooperation and feedback and you know, tell us what you're, what you're seeing and so we can put it in the big picture. My name is Lilia. Uh, that's what Ethel said. Uh, said. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I've been there for 22 years. This morning, I would like to talk about small hive beetles. Uh, first, I will go with the life history and a little bit of control and incorporating a lot of what I've done uh, research-wise. At the lab, it's just 50% of my responsibility. The other responsibility of mine is, of course, I'm a member of the Russian honeybee program. I don't know if you've heard about the Russian bee. They are resistant to grow mice, mice, and they have good honey production. And also, they are resistant to American fall root. And we're still all working on their resistance to Nicena. Ethel had shown you the damages, um, uh, brick pictures of the damages caused by um, small hive beetles. There's no doubt about that, that they can kill colonies. Although in literature you always read or you always hear people saying you keep your colonies strong. Or, in, indeed, the weaker colonies are the more susceptible ones, but strong colonies can also be overwhelmed. As you can see, that, that's one of the pallets. Uh, these are colonies from my experiments in Mississippi, and I was there two weeks before um, I saw this. Um, Slime out colonies. This one has lots of bees on the side there. Lots of honey, lots of bees when I was there two weeks of prior to this. And you can see the slime oozing, uh, oozing through the equipment. And you cannot really reuse those equipment. You, can, you just have to burn them. Um, it's been, we've been having problems uh, lately. We normally produce our queens for research and it's 
lately it's been difficult to get get them accepted. Um, sometimes when we graft, they eat that small high beetles eat some grafted larvae, and if there are cells that are accepted, like this one here, they poke a hole on the accepted queen cell and then lay eggs. As you can see here, there are larvae coming out from that. I, I opened this, this one, and there are larvae coming out from um, the accepted queen cell. They also lay eggs under the queen cell cups. As you can see here, there, there's probably 200, 300 eggs under this particular cell cup here. We use, we, Years ago, we used uh, these baby nooks, two-frame baby nooks, but now we went to three-frame, this is that Western um, type of, of frames now because we get a lot of slime, slime outs here using the baby nooks. Cell builders, this is one of our uh, cell build builders. In Louisiana, it can go... Um, 90s in summer it's very hot sometimes it, with the heat index it can go 105 and if you are producing queens they, if it's too hot they will the bees will be in front at, at the entrance and this is the time when the beetles take over they are very opportunistic so we ended up losing all of the uh, drafted larvae in this one Oh, these are just pictures that we took at um, Bo's property yesterday. And as you can see here, there are tons of larvae in just one. This is just one frame. And at the bottom, there are lots of them. Of course, there are, when brood is infested, the bees will also remove them. They, and they will end up, the, I mean, the pupae, they will end up on the bottom board. And that's protein for the developing larvae so they, they will grow there uh, very nicely. History, uh, life history of with the egg, look at the, they're both, the honeybee egg and small high beetle eggs are both white, but if you can see the, the shape of the honeybee egg is, is a lot bigger than the small high beetle egg. And also, as what Ethel said, they, uh, small high beetle eggs are laid in clusters. They don't need combs to lay eggs into. As you can see here, this just on top of a rim and on top of burr combs. And you can find them too on, if there are a little bit of burr comb on the bottom board, you can find them there too. Normally, they poke holes on on your cap brood and the pupae and lay it like this one and they lay eggs through the through the holes but if the bees are aggressive honey uh, small eye beetles are very smart they go hide in an empty cell and poke holes like this one these are holes these white ones there and look lay eggs that way Yes, the adjacent cells. Yeah, yeah, they can, they can do that. The larvae. Sometimes you, it's easily to get confused uh, for wax worms and sometimes fruit fly uh, larvae. But if you are in the field and you find larvae, the best way to um, find out whether or not they are small high beetles is just to squeeze them. If it pops easily, it's a wax worm. If, it, if it's not, it most likely it's a small high beetle because they have tough skin because they, that way they, they uh, to for protection when they burrow into the soil. The key characteristic is to look for these two rows of spines and here and there's one at the tip of uh, the at the uh, at the tip here, exterior. So this is the key characters. There's a distinct, all others a distinct segmentation. 
for a wax worm. Color wise, you can see some of the, the greater wax moths, they're big and sometimes gray in color. And of course, there's, there are no rows of spines. So it's, it's pretty easy to um, find those. Wax worms spin, spin cocoons, as you can see here, and they do it inside the colony. They make galleries in your combs, they destroy your combs. But for small hive beetles, they pupate in the soil. They need soil. Um, majority, I mean, most of the time, they need the soil to pupate. These are pupae, as you can see here. They don't make cocoons, but they make these um, chambers or cells. And I've seen, um, I've seen them making this um, earthen cell like this uh, under a microscope. A, a bee, a, a larva, will actually spit out mucus, it's just like a mucus uh, substance from their mouth. And it seems like they, if you can see here, it's pretty smooth around it. It seems like it's cementing, it's a cement for, uh, to protect them from rain, probably. So they will uh, just develop properly. Otherwise, they are very sensitive to, uh, I guess, to uh, flooding because they will uh, just rot. So with, with that, it's, it acts as a cement, waterproofing. <clears throat> if you read um, journals, for example, American Bee journals or uh, gleanings, you always see or read that um, small hive beetles like sandy soil. Actually, they can pupate in all types of soil, any type. Um, and normally you find them between 1 and 20 centimeters. But if you have, uh, there are decaying leaves, decaying branches of trees, they don't have to go deeper. They need, they just need that uh, Soil, you know, just a little bit amount of soil. They, that's enough for them. They don't have to go down. This is one of our yard in Mississippi. Uh, this particular yard, we took uh, soil samples. It's more predominantly clay uh, soil, but I found more beetles in this yard than in the other yard, which is predominantly sandy. Adults, they're easy to um, distinguish. You look for the club, look for this in club antenna. I always look at this first, actually, the shortened elytra. The, the wings are shorter than the abdomen. And then look at the feature of the thorax is just like a Batman cape. It's a sinuated thorax. This is how you distinguish a female from a male. A female will have this long ovipositor. When you press it a little bit, sometimes the poop will come out and it's got its white. So it's not really, really, you're not really looking at the ovipositor if you don't press it properly. But for males, they have this um, eighth tergite he here. Females don't have it. And if you look sideways, the genitalia of a male is on a 90 degree angle. So it's not really coming. Um, if you press it, it wouldn't stick out because it's facing you, most likely. You cannot see. Dr. Um, Lundy, Lundy is the first biologist who studied um, small hive beetles because small hive beetles originated from South Africa. Lundy is from Africa, and according to Lundy, the life cycle of small hive beetles uh, varies a lot 